2.01 is the approval of minutes. Motion is to approve the minutes of the board meeting for May 22nd, 2019. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 2.02 is the invoice listing. Motion is to approve the invoice listing for May through June of 2019. Do I have this motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 2.03, Treasurer's Report, Ms. Bell. As of April 30th, 2019, Pendoka's balance was $30,805,519. During May 2019, local, state, and federal revenues were totaled, excuse me, totaled $3,656,566. Disbursements were issued in the amount of $3,945,968. As of May 31st, 2019, PennDOT's current balance is $30,560,116. The motion is to approve the Treasurer's report for May 2019. Do I have this motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 2.04 is the budget transfer report. Motion is to approve the budget transfer report for May 2019 through June of 2019. Do I have this question? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Number three is student or staff recognition. Dr. Stein. Thank you, Mr. Armour. Uh, this is one of the favorite part. I think it may be the favorite part of each board meeting, where we get an opportunity to kind of pause the work of the board and recognize staff, students, or tonight, community members for really uh, exceptional work. And we give out certificates for excellence in academic achievement, excellence in the arts, excellence in athletic achievement. Tonight we're happy to give out a certificate for excellence in athletic achievement, but also for excellence in being an all around wonderful gentleman. I'm very pleased tonight here to have with us Sundown, former Sun Valley wrestling coach, Chuck Grisano. I'd like to read to you some information that was published in the newspaper about Mr. Grisano. Former Sun Valley wrestling coach Chuck Grisano was honored recently by the board of directors of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, Pennsylvania chapter. Mr. Grisano was presented with a Lifetime Service to Wrestling Award at a dinner held in Hershey. A Bridgley Township High graduate, Grisano suffered a broken leg in phys ed that kept him from wrestling while he was in high school. During his hospital stay, he met a candy striper named Mary Ann, who later became his wife. <laughs> After completing his studies at Wider University, he started the wrestling program at Northley Middle School in Pendelco School District. He became head wrestling coach at Sun Valley in 1972 and held that position all the way through the 2001 season. His career record at Sun Valley was 321 wins and 121 losses, including undefeated seasons in 1975 and 1985. Importantly, he founded 
the Delaware Valley Coaches Association in 1981. After retiring as the varsity head coach, Rosano spent two years as an assistant coach at Sun Valley. He was also a member of the District 1 Steering Committee from 1988 until 2005. He is a member of four halls of fame, Southeastern Pennsylvania Wrestling, Pennsylvania Wrestling Coaches, Delaware County Athletes, and Aston Sports. Among the letters of recommendation submitted on his behalf was one from one of his former Sun Valley captains, Captain James Ward, U.S. Navy retired. During my time in the Navy, I followed outstanding leaders and was taught by extraordinary men and women, said Captain Ward. When I reflect on those mentors and leaders who have had the greatest impact upon my life, I must say in the end, Chuck Prasano ranked at the top of that list. We have with us tonight uh, some of his proteges, and we have uh, the Ellis family here with Coach Ellis, and also we have Mr. Hill, a uh, teacher at Sun Valley, who was fortunate enough to coach with him. Uh, over the years, uh, I can tell you Mr. Hill has said great things about the effect that Mr. Prasano had on him, and that really got him motivated to become not just a great educator, but also a great coach for the students that are building as well. So we're very happy to present a certificate and to recognize Mr. Grisano for excellence in athletic achievement, but also for being a great reflection of our community and our school district. Mr. Grisano. <laughs> Next item on our agenda is, uh, not on the agenda, um, but certainly on our list to address tonight, uh, we also want to recognize our board secretary, uh, who is retiring. Uh, Tracy Marshall is our business administrator. She's been going through kind of a retirement tour <laughs> over the last month. It's been, it's been great. Uh, but we also, Tracy, wanted to recognize that besides being a business administrator, you have a role and that is being a board secretary. Uh, a lot of work involved in that. People have no idea the amount of hours it takes you and Fran preparing for this uh, board meeting making sure documents are, are completed, doing right to no requests, uh, making sure that we're following Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, and it's been a, just certainly a pleasure having you serve as our board secretary as well as business administrator. So uh, the board got you a little uh, thank you. Yeah. We'd like to offer you as well. Because we give out so many shots, you can never have enough. <laughs> Pendelco Proud Shirt, Pendelco Notebook, of course, Pendelco Hat, because the transportation department, they're all wearing that. Yeah. And a very expensive car. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Tracy, thank you. Thank you. Superintendent's reports. Thank you. Yep. Typically, uh, Tracy Marshall, our business administrator, will be presenting the final budget presentation. And I'll give to her as she departs after doing this for uh, 10 years for us. And so I'd be happy to take this over and share again with the board uh, the final details for the final budget that we are recommending approval for tonight. Uh, as you know, this process uh, began several months ago, as it always does. January, uh, the school 
the administration recommended uh, that we accept the opt-out resolution, which would say we would not raise taxes beyond the Act 1 index. In April, we presented a proposed final budget. Uh, in May 1st, we were notified by PDE the exact amount of our state allocation for our property tax reduction funding. May 15th, we presented the proposed final budget adoption with the final vote tonight, June 19th, 2019. We're recommending a uh, millage of 29.6803. That is an additional 0.8084 mills. That represents a 2.8% increase. It does not exceed the Act 1 index and it reflects a proposed budget that has $64.6 million in expenditures. Here's the breakdown for our expenditures, uh, salaries, benefits, and the uh, changes in those line items. Um, benefits, we've been fortunate in some of our health care savings in recent years by joining the Delaware County Health Trust. Uh, professional services moderate a little bit. Uh, that's uh, as, as a result of some offsets in some other areas. Uh, you'll see that we have uh, reflections of increased tuition costs to cyber and charter schools. Uh, supplies are moderate. Uh, financing just dips as we expected uh, for about a year and drops down by about 3% compared to prior years. Uh, we're also recommending that we continue to do $400,000 for budgetary reserve. Here's a pie chart that we typically show you. Gives you an idea of where the bulk of our expenditures go. Uh, as you would expect, we're in people business, so salaries and benefits would be the largest chunk of our costs. The expenditure increases this year are due to three new teaching positions. So we have an additional kindergarten position, additional special education position, and an additional regular education position at the elementary level uh, to address staffing and um, student count. We're going to continue to fund an elementary instructional coach. That position is very well received, very productive. That will be grant funded through the Ready to Learn grant, um, but it shows up as an expenditure as well. Uh, we are also recommending that we keep the English learner teacher. Uh, that will be offset by other reduced professional services. But again, that was a fantastic addition to our staff. We want to keep that position. Along with increased salary costs, come increased benefit costs, and we also have to address increased tuition costs due to uh, escalating numbers of students who are in charge cyber charter schools. We anticipate that that will moderate as the Pendelco Online program continues to grow, uh, but in the meantime, we are uh, reflecting an increase that reflects the trend in the last five years. Um, one point I would make here, um, this is the highest percentage of the budget that we have dedicated to instruction in the last 12 years. So uh, we are now 55% of our expenditures go to instruction. That means anything that happens in the classroom, right? So uh, a secretary in the main office, uh, administrative assistant, they're doing hard work, but they wouldn't show up in the instruction side of things. A nurse would show up in the instruction side. So, but classroom instruction, teaching and learning, that number uh, has grown during my time here from about 47% to 55% of our budget. It's something that we uh, continue to try to work on so that the bulk of our expenses go towards teaching and learning. Where does the revenue come from? Primarily local. Uh, it's really, frankly, an abysmal amount of uh, uh, state aid, we appreciate it, uh, but we also recognize that when Pennsylvania is ranked 47th in the country out of all states in terms of the amount of revenue they provide in funding for schools. And that is why uh, local property taxes feel that bite. Uh, the local property taxpayers understand that they, they carry most of the burden of funding our schools. Homestead allocation, $1.3 million, which will help uh, local taxpayers uh, to a degree shows there where our funds come from. Uh, a lot of federal mandates, but not a lot of federal dollars. So uh, what does that mean? Um, with the median assessment at 115.8, annual cost of taxpayer we anticipate will be $3,436.98, represents a proposed increase of $7.56 per month. Here's our historic millage rate increases. This year's proposed increase, I think, is uh, fourth lowest in the last 12 years, I believe. Uh, but you'll see there's been a very uh, credible effort to really minimize our increases, to keep them uh, down around the rate of inflation, if not much lower. Two key points, we do are not expecting any increases in state subsidies to a, of a meaningful amount uh, for us to be able to uh, reduce our request. 
According to the IDEX data from 2018, the AFRs that are submitted to the state, the average per pupil cost in Delaware County for all the districts is $19,218. That's what it costs, that's what they spend to educate a student. Pandelco spends $15,451. Um, that number has historically been very low. Uh, it goes back to some previous decades uh, where there was not a willingness to fund the schools uh, to the degree that there is today. Uh, and it remains a challenge for us. As you see, we are about $3,700 uh, behind the other average per pupil cost across the county. Back in 2008, we were about $2,000 behind. Uh, that is the effect of compounding increases in large budgets. We still have the lowest budget in Delaware County, but we are not the smallest district. We anticipate that Pendelco will still have the lowest average property taxes in Delaware County. Um, cyber charter funding reform, uh, I've talked to Senator Killian about that, I've talked to Representative Radicke about that. Uh, if the state would enact that funding reform and have us charge, charge $5,000 per student, which is the actual cost, other than $18,000 per student, that would save Pendelco taxpayers about an estimated $620,000. So that is our final budget, we hope. Uh, and uh, that you will support that tonight, and we believe we will continue uh, to be strong custodians of district funds. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Announcements for the public in accordance with Act 48, the Sunshine Law. Uh, the board met in executive session tonight to discuss personnel and litigation matters. Comments by members of the board? So, number seven is items for board information. Uh, we're going to start off with Tracy and, and Brian. They're going to give us a uh, <laughs> order report. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. I just want to give you a brief summary of uh, where we are with the Act 39. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, it was enacted this past year uh, for lead in drinking water. Uh, so we'll, uh, basically what we're doing is working with our environmental consultants, ECS, that's Environmental Control Systems Incorporated. And we're basically instituting a new flushing program uh, as interim control. Uh, in this new school year coming up, in the 1920 year, we may test random potable water outlets. But uh, going back to, so what we'll do is start right now instituting this flushing program starting this summer, and then we'll lead right into the school year. And basically it's a preventive maintenance protocol uh, where we remove and clean the aerators from the kitchen sinks, the nurse sinks, the faculty sinks, and start that flushing program. So we'll, we'll flush weekly. Uh, we literally run the water, uh, continuing to move that water in the, in the pipes the longer water sits in a pipe, uh, the more chance that any lead in a, in a joint, or probably uh, hopefully not solder anymore, uh, could leach into the water. So that's that's why we want to keep it uh, flush and keep that moving. Uh, so basically, uh, this assures that uh, that there, there's there's much less chance of, of, of lead being in, in the water. So uh, again. That, that's the requirement of the state at this point, uh, is to uh, announce this at a public meeting, and then uh, we'll have to decide next year where we want to go with it, as far as continue the flushing program, which I recommend doing no matter what, or to actually start testing, uh, random testing in all schools of uh, a section of those. Oh, I'm sorry, it's also water downs I didn't mention, mention uh, would also be flushed as well. Continue running. So, in case I had any questions, Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Uh, second one on the list would be the uh, teachers presenting. <coughs> I think uh, as the teachers are coming up, uh, talking to the board, uh, we, we do have on the agenda tonight uh, further discussion regarding requests to reconsider the current use of uh, student backpacks at Northern Middle School. Uh, just to set the stage for the work uh, that they're about to uh, discuss, uh, a few years back when we renovated the middle school, students were permitted to carry their backpacks and their book bags 
um, that they could not access their lockers. So there were entire sections of the middle school that just were not available or that were closed off. Or uh, during the school year, we also had um, lockers uh, being exchanged and new lockers being installed. Um, that practice of carrying the book bag um, remained kind of part of the day-to-day -day for a number of students. Um, and it has grown to become, we believe, the administration believes, a, a safety hazard, uh, a health hazard, and some other issues that are getting in the way of teaching and learning. Um, the teachers are very kind uh, to send two representatives uh, to kind of share their perspective. Uh, the reason why we're offering this is we understand uh, that board members who interact and talk to parents may hear a perspective from their students that's a lot different from the perspective of the teachers who are actually in the classroom working with the kids. Um, so we wanted to make sure the board hears a, a, a kind of a full-sided explanation of why the administration is proposing that we go back to what was in place, which is having students use their lockers rather than carrying their lockers around in their book bags all day long. Um, that actual policy essentially would show up in the code of conduct, uh, which the board will approve in January. So we wanted to have this discussion with you today. Um, we'll have all student code of conduct in January. There's a lot of time we say July. Thank you. To this all the time. Um, probably not the first time I've done it here. So in July, the board will approve any changes to code of conduct at that time. This would be one of them because we would indicate in the student handbook um, what the expectations are with regards to the book bags and what the implications would be for not you know, following those, those expectations. Um, so we have Kate Taylor, Nicole Armbruster here, and also PDA President Sherry Freeman. I want to take the opportunity to thank Sherry for a few years of service as PDEA President. Um, Sherry is stepping down so that she can dedicate even more time to classroom instruction uh, without consideration of, of, of her job as a uh, association president. We've had uh, a great partnership, great working relationship, and I was happy to hear that the members selected Nicole Armbruster as the next PDEA president. She will get to give a speech to our staff when they come back. Something a little <coughs> um, but let me turn it over to her. Um, and while uh, they're speaking to you, I'll also pass out uh, the results of our survey of other middle schools and uh, their use of backpacks and book bags. Well, thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Um, Nicole Arbor, sir. I just finished my 16th year teaching in Pendelco School District. I'm also a resident of Aston. Um, I chose to move here in 2006 when my son was starting first grade. I knew this was the district where I wanted him to receive his education. When we were looking for a new home in 2013, my realtor knew to only send me homes up for sale in Pendelco because this is where we were going to stay. Um, I'm sharing that because I want you all to know that I'm here not just as a teacher in North Lake, but as a community member invested in continually improving our district. Um, in our consideration of returning back to our previous policy, I wanted to share some of the issues that we have come across in the classroom. I was originally for allowing the students to carry their backpacks. I thought, what could go wrong? They're going to have everything they need. Everybody will be prepared every day. Um, and what I actually found was both a loss of instructional time during class and more issues in the hallway. So in the past, students walked in with what they needed for class on their desk. We could get right to work. Now I have 11 and 12 year olds reaching into their backpack to get one thing and coming across lots of distractions that they aren't ready to handle. They might see a missed phone call, a text, a Fortnite alert on their phone, um, candy, chips, gum, slime, Rubik's cubes, fidgets, all the things that they are not prepared to ignore when they reach in for the one thing that they need. Um, losing time at the end of the period when instead of putting finishing touches on their work, they're concerned with the bell's about to ring, I need to pack up so I can run out the second the bell rings. Um, the hallways, they are carrying everything. There are students using their lockers, but I've noticed more and more carrying everything all day long, which takes a sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader, and doubles their size. So now instead of having three kid, 300 kids in the hallway, it feels more like five or 600 people um, are unable to walk through the hallway. So although I thought it was originally a great idea to let them carry their backpacks, I found that it has had the opposite effect of helping. It is not helping anybody in my opinion. Um, I do appreciate your time and allowing us to share something. Thank you. 
uh, Kate Taylor. I'm also a Pendelka resident. My son graduated uh, from Southern Valley in 2017, and my daughter just finished her junior year. Um, I just finished my 22nd year here at North Lake as a special ed teacher at the middle school. And also, as a special ed teacher, when we first allowed the backpacks, I was like, this is going to be wonderful. A lot of my students really struggle with organizational piece, and this is going to be the best thing ever. But lately, the past two years, I've noticed that not so much. It's the opposite. They're carrying, it's essentially become a walking locker on their backs. And some of their backs are little, and they have a lot in there. So when they get to class, and the teacher's like, OK, get things out, and this is what we're doing today, here are the directions, they're turning around and digging through. and. Sometimes they find it, sometimes they don't, sometimes they find it and they pull it out and there's so much in there, things get ripped off, they're missing that really important piece at the beginning of the class instruction. Um, and then I really feel that they have no sense of what's important and what's not. At the beginning of the year, that whole first week of school, we really try to teach them not only how to open their locker and use their combination and whatnot, but we give them a planning sheet. This is what you need in the morning. This is what you need in the afternoon. Here's your scheduled breaks to go to your locker, and this is what you should get. And that really teaches them how to be organized. This is what I need, and when I get to class, I'm going to be ready to go. Now, they're not using their lockers. They're stuffing anything in there. And when they get to class, I think they get stressed out. I don't know where it is, I gotta dig through. Where in years past, when they only had that pile, all right, I'm ready to go, I have all my things, I'm ready to focus and, and get my day started. So I really feel that if we kind of go back to our previous policy, we can really teach those organizational skills and reteach them like each at each marketing period, like, hey, this is what I need, this is what I don't need, this is what I can get rid of, and really how to edit their materials so they know what's important and just teach them how to be, you know, adults and be organized. And which is so crucial. So thanks again for your time. If you have any questions for us, we'd be more than willing to answer them. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for this Taylor. Thank you. And thanks very much. Very informative. Um, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Kamenko, our assistant superintendent, just add a couple comments about the OFAC matter. Then you can go into a uh, discussion about the proposed uh, schedule change in the <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Stein. I actually had a chance to talk to a few students um, recently, just after PSSA testing. During PSSAs, we actually, we don't, they don't need the backpacks. They're, they're too busy taking state assessments. So I actually asked the students when they're, you know, during those couple weeks, you know, how did you feel it went with not having the backpack? Right? The first thing is it was so nice. I mean, and I told the, the, the student specifically I was going to share that because, um, they actually commented it was nice not to have the weight of, of the backpack. And he attested to what I just heard tonight, which is that it turned into not just carrying a few items, but their entire locker. So that actually that, that backpack was full. And it was, it was actually pretty nice just to walk from class to class without that backpack on their back, not to worry about that. And actually said I felt they enjoyed the time to actually go to the locker, and they felt a little bit more um, prepared in a way in class while they're actually at class. So that was like very consistent what I've heard from uh, the staff as well. I mean, from my perspective, like as a, as a safety piece, I mean that is definitely something that is always a safety concern with that backpacks. Um, and I think that you know when we talked with the staff, if there's some solid communication to to alleviate the concerns that maybe parents or students may have, may help with this. Um, for example, parents may be concerned about transition times. Our staff is ready and prepared to help them with that, build that in. We're not going to be writing uh, late slips for, you know, and write, making sure that they only have two minutes to get from class to class. Um, organization, as you, as you heard, is that um, teaching organization is part of a skill that our teachers do from the minute they start from kindergarten all the way through, you know, 12th grade. But definitely middle school is a, is a key piece. And how do you utilize that locker? So that would be a support for, um, piece that we could put in that communication element to say, and we would do some anticipation of like what would be the concerns of students as well as the parents. So that may be you know, something we can address to maybe alleviate some of that concern up front. So that, that, you know, that just kind of goes, I mean, as I said a couple months ago, I do, I do support that. You know, um, as has been recommended from North Dakota Middle School, I think um, it would be a good thing for the students. I think once it was implemented, I think it wouldn't be like, wow, I think it would be not much of a big deal. That's a big, big deal. Maybe it, it, some folks may think it is because the staff's already support the kids, and that's the most important thing. Make sure the kids are prepared, and that, you know kids aren't going to get in trouble. We're going to make sure they help them to feel supported with this transition to be successful. Good. 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 Good.
other stuff. But, so I don't think this um, <coughs> this did not make it in your, in your folders. Um, so I'm going to pass out just the uh, proposed schedule for uh, 1920. Um, some notes that um, the administration team, uh, myself, there's been a lot of eyes on this, as well as with staff input, faculty input from Northland Middle School. Starting probably, I would say, definitely in the mid-year of this past school year and finishing right up towards the end of this school year. Okay. Anytime you look at a schedule, the overarching goal is you want student achievement, right? You always want to think about instructional time and, and how we can always increase student achievement. And that's kind of the overarching um, goal, but we actually were able to hit 10 essential goals that we uh, went through as we developed this schedule. So the first one would be that we actually did, were able to use a block creatively to add instructional time. And that basically gave us more instructional time per week for each of the subject areas. So every course subject in ELA, math, science, science social studies will have actually an extra 42 minute block over a five day period. And, and for us to do that right now, that normally if you're aware that they run a six day schedule, it actually will now be a five day schedule, so a slight change, not a big, big deal. We're actually moving from an eight period schedule to a nine period schedule, although that reduces minutes in, a, in, a, in an actual class period per day, when you add that block, you actually increase minutes over the five day period. So actually we're hitting, what we used to do uh, this past year was 240 minutes, we're actually hitting 252 minutes just in that five day period. There's also a lot of block benefits, um, lot, and this is actually feedback from departments that we receive through administration as well, is that science will have more time for labs, social studies more time for researching and writing in the content area, math and ELA will have more time for small group targeted instruction, as well as interventions. Other goals that we wanted to hit is that we have to make sure we meet the contractual obligations and requirements. We. Um, also want to keep status quo with all our courses. It has no impact on courses nor staffing, so it's status quo there. Uh, per staff input, attempt to rotate class times to minimize effect on early dismissals or late arrivals. So if you're in a sport, for example, you have to leave early, you're not missing, as classes rotate, you're not missing the same class at the end of the day multiple times within one week. Per staff input, attempt to less transitions to minimize hallway disruptions. That, that is the in essence of why you would form a block. Per staff input, keep Common Bell, which is in place this year, but that helps us be able to um, give opportunities for kids to accelerate, or, or also when you have special education teachers, they can cover students at multiple grade levels if need be. Uh, we had a consultant in a couple years ago, and uh, their recommendation is to actually have one teacher teaching ELA, so we're able to accomplish that as well. We also want to improve the difficult last period transition back to homeroom. And that was uh, the thought. Now is to actually have homeroom a little bit longer time in the morning to actually get them ready for the day, get them organized for the day. But they are saving a little bit of time at the end of the day so they have a chance to make sure they gather their homework before they, they head home. Um, so we also feel that it's a more efficient use right now using um, of our teaching staff. The schedule enables special education teachers more flexibility to service their students to either push in or actually pull out to support students. The schedule also enables, uh, for example, I'll give one for EL teachers to not to be able to provide EL services, not during a prep, which is happening right now. We can actually do that in a, in a class period. Um, teachers also will be available six sections per day. It also helps guidance uh, speech teachers, OT, PT, to have more flexibility with that schedule so they can serve students. Um, Talked about the homeroom change. Additional benefits, just something that actually came out. It's not something necessarily we went after to do. It wasn't like the overarching goal, but actually smooth, it smooths out some of the class size issues. We have some, especially related arts, we have some really high number of classes because um, it's only five sections that a teacher may be teaching. It actually created an influx and some, an increase in class size. Some classes are actually smoothing it out as we start to plug students in just to kind of get a draft going. Um, so again, this is you know the, the intent is the schedule is to always help with student achievement. And I think it gives a roughly a, a change to do that. It has had a lot of eyes on it. Has a lot of the suggestions um, the administration at Northway did take, um, especially that rotating piece. And, and so I think it's you know it's it's a, it's a great opportunity for for teachers and staff to actually increase instructional time, which would hope then 
increase student achievement. Thank you, Mr. Kamenka. So, uh, again, we would, in the, in the uh, July meeting, ask that you'll uh, approve the new schedule. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Eric, for working, particularly with Mr. Lucas and the team of teachers over there you know, to make some improvements. Again, you guys have 10 goals, if almost all of them. It's certainly a challenge. There's no perfect schedule out there. We believe there's incremental improvements. Uh, so that'll be part of the uh, agenda for July. Uh, we also understand that uh, administration will not move forward uh, typing up handbooks or changing code of conduct until uh, we have the board support uh, for these things. Uh, between now and then, Mr. Kamek and I will continue to uh, send you some uh, more supportive information back with information electronically. So, be able to make the determination comes about. Thank you. Thank you. Number nine, public comment. Anyone? Say no. Number ten is items for board action. Starts on page two, carries on three, four, five, six, seven. Aging. References of Penduco Budget 2018-2019, Penduco Budget 2019-2020, Act 93 Plan, PDEA Agreement, PDESPA Agreement, PDSSPA Agreement, and the PA School Code Section 1108B. It is administrative recommendation to approve all personnel items as presented. Do I have a Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Tonight, we're going to utilize the consent agenda. Uh, we will pull 10.11. We will need to do that separately. Uh, in addition, we will add 10.19. Uh, I will read that one as the superintendent's contract addendum. Motion is to approve the employment agreement addendum with the superintendent as presented. Uh, so we're going to start with 10.03 through 10.19, excluding 10.11. Uh, does any board member wish to have anything removed um, off that? If not, I need a motion to approve those. Second. Uh, please note that all contracts, preparations, and solicitations and bids are subject to the solicitor's review. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. So 10.11 is the election of school board treasurer. <coughs> I'll open the floor for nominations. Motion to close nominations. So moved. Nominations are closed. Motion is to elect Colleen Powell serves as school board treasurer from July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Questions about it? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. <laughs> Number 11 comments by members of the public. Number 12 is comments by members of the board. Uh, Dr. Steinhoff is going to do a little quick uh, synopsis on his agenda. Please. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Armour. Just, just for purposes of uh, clarity to the public, uh, so the board did approve an agenda to my contract tonight. I appreciate the support for that. Uh, very simply, uh, this will uh, uh, permit the, the superintendent to freeze my base salary, uh, not accrue an increase, an annual increase. Uh, but instead have additional vacation days that have to be used that year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Any other comments by members of the board? Next meeting is Wednesday, July 17th, 2019. The business meeting here at the service center at 7.30. Motion for adjournment. So moved.